Uh, good morning. Boy, it's, it's a great day, isn't it? Uh, <clears throat> we got, we've been getting some rain, and, and I guess we've needed that um, pretty much. Um, uh, we sure have. I, um, I guess I just have to comment about the, the music this morning. My goodness, uh, uh, goodness gracious, Jeff, and uh, you, you boys did good. Yeah, you boys did good. And um, Aaron, uh, oh, you can play that piano and sing. Multi-talented, huh? I guess, huh? Actually, I, I was a straight-A student. Did you know that? And I got C's in Glee Club. <laughs> Couldn't sing very well, you know. Still can't. Um, um, but um, um, that's all right. Brothers and sisters, we had a great class this morning. Our teacher did very well, and his preparation was certainly felt. Thank you so very much. But we talked about the last days a little bit and the tribulation. I don't think tribulation is something that you should just worry and worry about at all. Because the Lord has told us in, in many different ways that if we'll draw close to him, he will bless us and preserve us. And, uh, but, uh, you know, Sometimes we feel in our church that, uh, well, I believe in the Lord, and so I don't maybe need to do as much. A, a typical scripture that bishops sort of uphold, 147 in the dark, stewardship is the response. Well, we can say that about discipleship, can't we? Discipleship is a response. And so uh, you need to, to draw close. To the Lord. I've got four of my friends up here. These, these are fine men. And, uh, and they are. And uh, I've talked to them a little bit as we've gone along and can feel such a good spirit in them. And uh, we look forward to their participation in John to your sermon today. We sure do. One other little compliment I want to make is... Um, John Gwynn, you got three little boys with you this morning? Uh, I guess you can handle that, can you? <laughs> what I want to say is I've never, I just think the, the parenting of our little children and our young people in this congregation is awesome. Awesome parents. And... Uh, Awesome people. And uh, you come today to expect the Holy Spirit. And you need to be fed by that Holy Spirit. Prayer meeting. I don't know how many. I couldn't count where I was sitting last time. But I know I've counted up to 75 at a time. If you get a chance to come on Wednesday evening, come to the prayer service. No, they're awesome. And the little children participate in prayers and things like this. And I have to believe that the angels in heaven smile upon us. Here's a little scripture. One of my favorite. Third book of Nephi, chapter 4. Uh, read it every day if you can. Yea, verily I say unto you, if you will come unto me, you shall have eternal life. Behold, my, my arm of mercy is extended toward you, and whosoever will come, him will I receive, and blessed are those who come unto me. Behold, I am Jesus Christ, the Son of God. I created the heavens and the earth and all the things that are in them. I was with the Father from the beginning. I am in the Father, and the Father in me. And in me hath the Father glorified his name. I came unto my own, and my own received me not. And the scriptures concerning my coming are fulfilled. And as many as have received me, 
to them have I given to become the sons of God, and even so will I do to as many as shall believe on my name. I am the light and the life of the world. I am Alpha and Omega, and the beginning and the end. You shall offer for a sacrifice unto me a broken heart and a contrite spirit. And whosoever cometh unto me with a broken heart and a contrite spirit, him will I baptize with fire and with the Holy Ghost. Behold, I have come into the world to bring redemption unto the world, to save the world from sin. Therefore, whosoever repenteth and cometh to me as a little child, just like our participation here this morning, who repenteth and cometh unto me as a little child, him will I receive, for of such is the kingdom of heaven, of God. Our opening hymn will be number 46 in the purple, and uh, we'll stand for this hymn and be invocation by Jason Crosley. <laughs> Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, as it was sung, blessed be your name. We want to thank you for this day and the opportunity to come to your house of worship. And we invite your Holy Spirit to preside over this service. And Lord, I pray that our hearts and mind will be focused on you and your word. I pray for your servant John, and that his spirit will be, or that your spirit will be with him as he brings your message to us today, that your teaching will bring us closer to you and help us to build your kingdom here on earth and that we would always be seeking to do your will. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Would you pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. We're so grateful for it and for the opportunity that it provides us, the chance that you've given us to grow closer to you. And Father, we're grateful for this portion of this service, of our worship of you, and the opportunity that we have to give back that which you've provided, to offer that which is truly yours. And Father, we pray that we do that throughout this week with our time and our service. We pray that you'll take this offering and that you'll bless it so that it can truly benefit those in need and that you'll continue to be with all of us so that we may do those things that please you. Father, this is our prayer in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. I'm going to read from the 21st chapter of the book of John. And um, let me check my notes to see where I'm supposed to read here. Oh, yeah. Beginning at the 12th verse. Jesus saith unto them, Come and dine. And none of the disciples durst ask him, Who art thou? Knowing that it was the Lord. Jesus then cometh and taketh bread and giveth them and fish likewise. This is now the third time that Jesus showed himself to his disciples after that he was risen from the dead. So when they had dined, Jesus saith to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my lambs. Good 
Good morning. It's really a joy to be with you here this morning. Not really here, here, but here. Uh, to be with uh, the family that God has given us as an expression of his love in our lives. That is, is most fully manifest in what we celebrated last week together, the gift of his son and his resurrection. And I really appreciate the music this morning. It was... It was really beautiful. Thank you, everyone, Terry and Aaron and Jeff and the boys. This is the, the youngest singers of the old, old path I think I've ever heard. It was beautiful. His faithful follower, I would be. In John 21 there, those verses I read, um, this moment that's described um, is one of the final moments that um, Jesus was able to spend a little time with his disciples face to face while he was here on the earth with us. It's not all of his disciples. If you start at the first of that chapter, you'll see that. I don't know if that was purposeful on Jesus' part. I wonder about that. When I think about that setting and what they did there that day, um, it, really, it really touches me. Um, it just seems intimate and beautiful. They're on the lake. He took time to fix dinner for his friends. And if that's all that it was, just a tender moment with, with those men that he loved, I think that would be enough. It would be enough for me. I would be like John. I would want to write it down and save it so that you and I could read it in the future. Recorder for history. But I believe that those moments were very important to Jesus. And I think he purposely orchestrated them for the benefit of those disciples. He does love them. And it, it's, it's very clear in what we read there. the things that he does and says. And I think our Savior, knowing the plan, is looking forward. And he's seeing what these men must do to carry on the work of building God's kingdom on earth. And that for him, that this is a final teaching moment in the flesh I think that he wanted it that way so they could hear the tenderness in his voice and so they could see the love in his eyes because he knows what's coming for them. He called them and he taught them for this purpose, for the work of building his church on the foundation that he'd laid during his ministry, Christ's ministry on earth. That's reflected in his prayer for his disciples in John 17. Beginning in the sixth verse, and he's speaking to his Father in heaven. Jesus says, I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world. Thine thy wor they were, and thou gavest them me, and they have kept thy word. And then verse 13, and now I come to thee, 
And these things I speak in the world that they, his disciples, might have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them thy word, and the world hath hated them, because they're not of this world, even as I am not of the world. I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but thou shouldest keep them from the evil. Jesus is keenly aware of the spiritual principle of opposition in all things. And he knows how it affects all of his followers, how it affects you and me. With his disciples, he'd gathered them from out of the world, as it said there in John 17. from their lives in the material world, and that was most of their lives up to that point. And he takes them into three years of an immersion in the world where the totally, fully, completely spiritual collides with the material world. The spiritual confronts the material and exposes it for all its opposition to God's holiness. And in doing that, it compels every one of us to make a choice. That is described well in in Helaman, the fifth chapter. And the 86th verse. He hath given unto you that ye might know good from evil. And he hath given unto you that ye might choose life or death. And ye can do good and be restored unto that which is good. Or have that which is good restored unto you. Or ye can do evil and have that which is evil restored unto you. Brother Ron said in his opening remarks that discipleship is a response. And he's right. He is right. It is our rightful response to our Heavenly Father. So there they are on the shore and they're having breakfast with Jesus that he prepared for them. But let's go back a little bit. Let's go back about 10 hours or so. That's described in John 21. About 10 hours before Jesus appeared on the shore or so, I would guess. And John 21 tells us there were seven disciples gathered together. It also tells us that Jesus had appeared to his disciples at least two times prior to his resurrection, or since his resurrection. A few of them had gathered together there on the shore of the lake, and John doesn't tell us why. He doesn't tell us what they're talking about. Really, in John 21, there's not a lot of dialogue. And then... In the first few verses, without any preamble at all, Peter says, I'm going fishing. And his buddies that are there with him reply, good idea, let's go fishing. James and John are there, and they, you'll remember, they were his partners in that enterprise of fishing back before the time they were called to serve as Jesus' disciples. I bet that seemed like a lifetime ago to them after all they just experienced. Those three years of walking with him and all the things they must have seen and done and experienced together. And then culminating in his crucifixion 
in his resurrection, him appearing to them after what they'd seen happen to him on the cross. Do, do you get a feel for what the mood must have been like among those men sitting by the shore? I like to fish. I went fishing yesterday. It was really windy. <laughs> I fished hot, windy, cold, rainy. I fished when the ice forms in the guides of my rod. I fished a lot of times when I didn't get a bite. But I still like to fish. Not quite as much. I'm not quite as passionate about it as I used to be, but I, I still really like it. When I think about how I love to fish and I think about the scriptures we read, um, it makes me think about how, for me, it was never unusual that, oh, if I felt maybe life was treating me bad or I'd made a mess of things or I just wanted to get away for a while from the day-to-day -day grind. Um, I would be like Peter, and I'd say, I'm going fishing. <laughs> and I wonder if that's how he was feeling that evening. Because I want to focus on Peter a little bit today. He's a, he's a really special guy. He had had mountaintop experiences with Jesus. I mean, literally. Consider the transfiguration. He'd seen healings. He'd seen the multitude fed. He'd seen the dead brought back to life. He heard sermons and teaching that were literally the word of God. And he'd seen his leader put to death. I, th I think the spirit, if I could project how the spirit works within me and think about how it must have been working on Peter at that time, there by the lake, I'll bet he's thinking about that it can't stop here. It's got to go on. There's something I need to do now. I'll bet that's how the Spirit was working on him. Carrying on the work that led to Christ's condemnation and, and it was by the hand of the crowd that could have freed him. That's what Peter's facing and I, I believe that's what he was thinking about. Knowing in his heart, maybe, that Jesus now wants him to be a leader where before he'd been a follower. Not anymore just to be a student uh, and, and be in the powerful presence of the Son of God, but to go out and do that kind of work. He told Jesus he would follow him to the death if need be. But then it wasn't much time later that he denied even knowing him in the face of whatever danger was posed by being associated with Jesus. And I don't mean, I don't mean to condemn him at all. Because while I don't know exactly what was going through his mind, in those moments? Maybe he was feeling like I do sometimes, or like maybe you do. I'm not good enough. I'm weak. I don't want to fail you again. 
Let's go fishing. They fished all that night, and the scriptures tell us they fished all night and they didn't catch anything, not until Jesus got there. We call that getting skunked or catching what the little boy shot at. There's a lot of technical stuff like that that goes on in fishing. But I wonder if that situation seemed familiar to Peter and James and John because they, there was another time when they had gotten skunked and Jesus appeared on the scene. And I think you know what time I'm talking about. Let's look at that in the Gospel of Luke in the fifth chapter. In the first 11 verses, it came to pass as the people pressed upon him to hear the word of God, he stood by the lake of Gennesaret and saw two ships standing on the lake, but the fishermen were gone out of them and were wetting their nets. And he entered into one of the ships, which was Simon's, and prayed him that he would thrust out a little from the land. And he sat down and taught the people out of the ship. Now when he had done speaking, he said to Simon, Launch out into the deep and let down your net for a draft. And Simon answering said unto him, Master, we have toiled all night and have taken nothing. Nevertheless, at thy word I will let down the net. And when they had done this, they enclosed a great multitude of fishes and their net break. And they beckoned unto their partners who were in the other ship that they should come and help them. And they came and filled both ships so that the ships began to sink. When Simon Peter saw the multitude of fishes, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he was astonished, and all who were with him, at the draft of fishes which they had taken. And so were also James and John, the sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said unto Simon, Fear not. From henceforth, for thou shalt catch men. And when they had brought their ships to land, they forsook all and followed him. What do you think about the way that Jesus engaged Peter at this early moment in their time together? He called him to um, serve him in a small way, using some skill and experience that he already had. And Peter really couldn't turn him down. He may have been thinking about the fact that just a, a chapter or so earlier there in Luke's account, Jesus had healed his Peter's mother-in-law when she was gravely ill. And so Jesus says to Peter, let me get in your boat so I can talk to this crowd better. And Peter does it. He accepts that call, that little beginning call. And this is the way it is in our walk with him, in our first steps in our walk with him. A lot of times he calls on us to use some skill or experience we already have in a way that we can kind of handle. Come on, you can do this. And, and I can tell you, it's not easy to hold a boat in one spot. I've got a boat with an electric trolling motor, and I have trouble holding it in one spot even when there's a light breeze. But Peter did it. He took that first step, and that's real important for us to think about, taking that first step when our 
Heavenly Father calls to us. Sometimes we respond to his call because of something he's done for us in the past. Maybe when we were desperate, like Peter was when his mother-in-law was so sick. But what's important is he took that first step. And then Jesus finishes up preaching and he challenges Peter's skill and knowledge as a Sea of Galilee fisherman. If we do a little digging, we'll find out that the fish in the Sea of Galilee, they school up at night. And when we read in Luke and we read in John, they fished at night. They school up at night and come in close to the shore where there are inlets to the lake the streams and the rivers, and that's where they feed. And at night, they can't see the fishermen's net so well either. In the daytime, they scatter out. But Jesus says to Peter, take the boat out into the deep part of the lake and let down your net here in in the middle of the day. Well, you know, Peter's got to be thinking, wrong place, wrong time. What if, he'd, what if he'd said to the Lord, forget about it. It's, that's a waste of time. That's, that's a pretty interesting scenario. When you think about what Peter eventually meant to, to this church, to every church that cherishes this gospel, So Jesus says to Peter and and John and James, come with me, follow me. I'm going to make you fishers of men. But Luke, he doesn't tell us much about what happened between Jesus saying, follow me, and, and the beginning of their true discipleship. It just says that they forsook everything and followed him. But I got to believe there were just a couple more steps in there. I think Luke was going for brevity there, maybe. Because Peter's a married man. And, uh, well, all the married men in the room know what I'm talking about. We don't, we don't go off on an adventure without checking in with Mama. When we read about Peter in his discipleship, um, there's, there's not a whole lot of information about Peter's ministry in and of itself. Um, but after Jesus returned to heaven, we know in the New Testament record that Peter became to be, he became to be on fire for the gospel message. He was a powerful force in the early church. He took that first little step when Jesus said, take me out in your boat a little ways. And, and we look at the end game and what happened. When we respond to God's call, there will be an outcome. Even when our faith is weak, even when the situation looks like a loser, there will be an outcome. And sometimes it's powerful and life-changing. It was for me. And it was for Peter. But back to Jesus' fishing trip there. You know what happened? He caught so many fish that it broke the net. And he he realizes what's going on. He's seen Jesus heal his mother-in-law, and now Jesus performs another miracle. And Peter falls down humbled at Jesus' knees. In the presence of all that is holy, Peter becomes desperately aware of his sin. In verse 8, it 
Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. That's the way I felt, too. All I could see was my sin. It was, it was hard to hear that call. Hard to, I could hear the call. It was hard to get beyond the sin. But sometimes we have to be shaken to our very core and wake up to the truth and take a hold of the answer to our needs, the answer to the master's call. But again, I think that there were probably a few more steps between Peter leaving the nets that day and, and, and becoming Jesus' disciple. And I, I wonder if, besides checking in with the wife, if maybe he thought about all the wealth that that great catch of fish represented. Maybe... He experienced some reservations about leaving his established way of life, the life that he was comfortable with, about taking this great leap of faith. And maybe I'm just thinking about, or I'm influenced maybe by how I think I would respond to a call like that. Would I be ready? To, to set aside everything that makes up my life today, all that I'm comfortable with and familiar with. and What are we willing to do when Christ says, take up your cross and follow me? So we have these two fishing trips. One at the time of the call, one at the time after Jesus' resurrection. They're like bookends to the time that Peter spent with Jesus. The first time was a starting point. It was, it was just one of a lot of examples of Jesus picking just the right men and women to take up the work of the kingdom. They weren't scribes. They weren't religious leaders. They weren't great orators. They weren't people of influence. They were just women and men like you and me. What is special about them is everything that happened once they ultimately responded to God's call with their whole heart. When we go to the second of those fishing trips for a little bit, let's, let's, let's put ourselves there for a little bit. When I read those verses at the end of John, I, I kind of feel like they... They resonate with some, I don't know, melancholy maybe or nostalgia. Um, they'd had all those days together, traveling and fellowshipping and um, doing God's work. And, and I, I think that they could see that this was, this was a new chapter, the pages being turned. Jesus <laughs> everything he does is so beautiful he demonstrates again the humble beauty of, of servanthood as he, he makes a meal for his disciples like a last intimate dinner with dear friends he'd given Peter another boatload of fish hadn't he It would, I think it would be like a reminder to Peter of how it all started. He would definitely be reminded again 
that a, a big catch like that is, would be worth a lot in, in terms of the way the world reckons value. But Jesus says, lovest thou me more than these? Do you love me more than a quiet life as a fisherman? More than the things that a great pile of fish could buy? More than the peace and tranquility of a quiet meal with dear friends on the shore of a beautiful lake? Peter. Peter, you know I'm asking you to take on a life of great challenge and hardship. To win souls for me. Peter, do you love me more than this? Is the spiritual greater than the material? Our Heavenly Father knows that we live in a material world. He knows that the spiritual depth of this life that he intends for us is often obscured, conflicted by the daily grind of the things that we have to do, making ends meet, taking care of the family that we love so much. Our Heavenly Father knows these things. He wants us to see the spiritual value and all those material blessings that he sends our way. And he wants us to trust in his goodness that he's going to carry us through when things get hard. He wants us to see and accept that 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 tree up on the cliff that is, is battered by the wind and the storms, it gets stronger because of all that abuse. And as it makes it through the the drought, that it becomes more resilient to stress that it faces. Our Heavenly Father is asking us to look beyond the material and see how he's calling to us. Do you love me more than these? He calls us to trust us Trust him beyond our comfort zone and and from the heart to be able to respond, yes, Father, I love you more than all of that. I will feed your sheep. Going back to John again, the 21st chapter and the 18th and 19th verses, This is Jesus speaking to Peter. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, when thou wast young, thou girded thyself and walks whither thou wouldest. But when thou shalt be old, thou shalt stretch forth thy hands, and another shall gird thee and carry thee whither thou wouldest not. This spake he, signifying by what death he should glorify God, And when he had spoken this, he saith unto him, follow me. I think this might have been that watershed moment for Peter, this this very moment maybe. I I don't know for sure. But it, it, it seems to me like this is that moment when Peter was was finally able to put on every piece of the armor of God. Think about the big picture of Peter the disciple, what, we, what comes to mind when we think about him. We, we think about, um, you know, all his spontaneity and his, his passion uh, about the work, serving Jesus, being his disciple. And... I think we're also struck by his impulsiveness and how he reacts when there's conflict. It's like maybe he's overcompensating for something that he feels like he lacks. 
Maybe he doesn't feel like he's worthy of Jesus' trust. Maybe he lacks faith that God will help him overcome his own shortcomings. The adversary knows how to exploit every gap in our armor. And we see that as well, don't we? As we consider Peter's discipleship. We think about those times when Jesus called to Peter to walk on the water and he sank a little bit. We remember the times that Well, like when he denied Jesus before the crucifixion. When he couldn't come to grips with Jesus going to the cross, he just didn't understand. He took out a sword and he struck one of the soldiers come to arrest Jesus. Can you imagine having Jesus say to you, get thee behind me, Satan? Because he said that to Peter when Peter argued with him about going to the cross. But then think about Peter's ministry after these moments. Now we see all that familiar passion, and it's it's fully focused on the work that Peter had originally been called to do, the call that started with, take me out in your boat a little ways. Peter saw Jesus on the cross. Peter saw Jesus carried to the tomb. Peter saw Jesus resurrected. Peter saw Jesus on the shore. Peter was instructed with other disciples by Jesus for 40 days after his resurrection. And we read that in the first chapter of Acts. In the second chapter we see that Jesus kept his promise and poured out upon those followers the Holy Ghost, giving them the power that they would need. He became the nickname that Jesus gave him. He became the rock. He was a rock for the early church. There are biblical accounts like this, like Peter's, And we see those moments where Isaiah or Paul or Peter, they have that spiritual breakthrough and they become everything that they were called to be. So I want to ask you today, what will it take for us? The power that he's given us together to answer his call and put it to work for him. This spake he signifying by what death he should glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he saith unto him, follow me. I wonder if that day that Peter dined with Jesus on the shore. Was that the last day he ever went fishing? I sure hope not. Dear Heavenly Father, what a privilege it is to gather in your house today and to sit under the influence of your spirit. We desire that we would allow your spirit to work in our lives and that your spirit would go with us and help us to accomplish your work. Pray that you would bless us with your ministering angels that we may be more... uh, able to accomplish your will. Go with us and strengthen us, and may your will be done, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.